Uh, it, it really is an honor for me to, uh, to be here tonight and to, and to moderate this panel. Um, I want to give you an opportunity, actually, to, uh, to pose your questions to the panel. So I'll, I'll ask a few questions of them at first, and then we'll, we'll jump straight into your questions. Um, it, it's hard, just a, f a few words, just to set the context. It, it's hard this evening, um, from what we've heard, not to think about war zones, about uh, journalists in bulletproof vests, the frontline um, battlefield reporting, and the courage and, and bravery uh, that requires. Uh, and given the current context, I find it hard to imagine that this sort of frontline reporting is going to go away anytime soon. That said, um, it is hard to deny, as Stephen said right at the start, that a, a digital frontline um, has also been emerging. WikiLeaks, uh, Panama Papers, reporting of corporate tax avoidance, uh, election race analysis, a la Nate Silver. Journalism that requires uh, data analysis like never before. Analysis uh, that allows us to reach conclusions that traditional reporting perhaps doesn't allow us to reach. This sort of journalism is still uh, about providing information to help inform us of the important issues of the day. It's still about holding power uh, to account and still requires uh, a lot of bravery uh, and a lot of courage. Uh, it is not a replacement of traditional journalism, but an addition to it. Uh, that is how I'm setting up this panel discussion. The panel is called Big Data, Dangers on Journalism's New Frontline. I'll ask the panelists to join us in just a moment. First, we want to run this short film. Knowledge, the I think the, the great mix of, of well seasoned political uh, reporters and editors we have in this room, and uh, the journalist students that uh, we have joining us tonight. Right, Tom Bergen uh, is from Reuters. He is an award winning investigative journalist, most recently recognized for his work exposing corporate tax avoidance. Um, he has won the George Orwell Prize for Journalism and a Jared Lowe Award. Tom, come and join us on the stage. Uh, Iona Craig is now a freelance writer, of course, we just heard. I'm not actually going to go through her whole biography because we just heard it, but um, I do want to mention a couple of um, uh, awards. She has won the Martha Gellhorn Prize and the Frontline Club Print Award, and this year the Orwell Prize for Journalism. 
uh, as well as tonight's award. Iona, um, where are you? There, come on back up. Uh, and um, finally, Helena uh, Bengston, uh, editor for data projects at The Guardian. Uh, she has also been database editor at Sveriges Television and the Center for Public Inter uh, Integrity in Washington, D.C. Come on up as well, Helena. Uh, as I said, uh, I'm going to kick us off uh, for 15, 20 minutes or so. Then I, 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 I'm going to let you guys have a go at these three. Um, let, let me ask you, Helena, just to, to, just to start with. Um, Tim Berners-Lee said, data journalism is the future. Journalists need to be data savvy. Is that true? Yes and no, I would say. I am, I've been a data journalist for a very long time. I don't believe in the people who say that every journalist should know how to code. I think that there are people who know how to code much better than journalists, so why not collaborate with them? I think that journalism, that said, I think that journalism would benefit from journalists knowing how to not be afraid of a spreadsheet, to maybe even know how to sort it or do simple calculations. And actually about 90% of what we call data journalism is made by those simple skills that I can teach any one of you in an afternoon, I promise. <laughs> All right. And I know, look, there are a lot of, as I said, there are a lot of journalist uh, students here. And, and these people, a number of them, hire journalists. So we will tell you what it takes uh, in just a second, or they will tell you in just a second. I know, let, let me ask you, we, 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 we heard you speak just now. Um, how do you use data in your reporting? Do you use data in your reporting? To what extent will you in the future? Um, I haven't done really in the past, although I did do a stint at the Bureau of Investigative Journalism, which required two weeks of data entry. So perhaps that was enough to put me off data for quite some time. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm working on a piece at the moment that I can't really go into too much detail, but I've been working on for some time, which um, originated from getting information from the ground um, of a lot, some of it anecdotal, but of sources on the ground, and then realizing that there should be data available, then it was the scenario of getting hold of the data, which isn't always straightforward, and then using that data. Um, and um, I did actually some basic data visualization for myself, just to be able to see, before I even got into the kind of reporting of it, or, or trying to write the story, what it, what it was showing me. But yeah, that was kind of the first time I'd worked with data, and it was a little bit scary does, I mean, does it excite you now, using data? Or was it something you feel you... You have to do now as we move forward. It does excite me as long as you have the time to dedicate to it. And I think this is a problem, you know, it's a problem with ju journalism in general. But I think if you're trying to do it in a hurry, um, and also I have ended up collaborating with, with somebody on, on some of it, also because I feel that doing it with a single pair of eyes when I'm not that experienced in doing, doing, dealing with data necessarily that it's not a wise thing to be necessarily doing on your own. Um, and also consulting sort of experts in the field of where this data has come from. But yeah, it's abs without it, um, I, I, it would be hard to probably get my story to stand up. And also it kind of makes it undeniable once you have the data to, yeah. to back yeah. it up. You know, the, the title of this, this panel is Big Data Dangers on Journalism's New Frontline. And, I, you know, I've got to admit, it puzzled me a little bit because I always thought, you know, this idea of data, this is how we, we verify stuff, this is how we really give it credibility. But, Tom, let me, let me br bring you in. Uh, it, it seems to me that the, the problem is with how people interpret the data. We as readers, me as a non-mathematically-minded reader, uh, needs to trust you, uh, the journalist, to interpret the data correctly, right? Yes, I mean, uh, with respect to the kind of work that I do, I generally use uh, data. Uh, it, it, it's a, lo a lot of it to look at what corporations are doing um, or other, you know, maybe powerful people, wealthy people. And what I'm usually doing is using data to tell another story. And that would probably, of course, then require me to overlay various different uh, data sets. So it could be, uh, you know, it could be trade data with corporate data along with procurement data to show that, you know, medical equipment is being sold to Siberian hospitals at three times the price at which it should be sold. Mm -hmm. um, 
But it, it's complicated. I mean, the problem with, with data is complicated, and sometimes you're making a few jumps. So there, there is a, a degree of interpretation and understanding there that's required. And at the end of the day, you know, if you're trying to assess, is somebody gaming a regulation? Um, it's possible that you're wrong, and, and therein lies some of the danger. That's certainly one of the sort of dangers of, of the frontier. And um, you know, there, the, the, if you're using data to build up your a picture of a system which you're then going to depict and in the process accuse people of a lot of money and, and, and power of wrongdoing, you know, you're not going to be there uh, you know, hitting the button on that one feeling you know, totally without any, any butterflies in your stomach. Mm -hmm. so, so, so there's al always that risk. But it's interesting, I mean, after hearing about you know, Iona's reporting and others, it's, um, you know, it's, it is, as you say, interesting and, and the danger. But what, when I think about it, it, you know, the dangers are somewhat inverted as to who really faces them. And I, now, you know, even with doing that, so clearly there's, there's not really much physical danger. I mean, yeah, sure, if you're, I mean, it's conceivable that some of the money launderers I might get in contact might not be very happy with me, but generally very little uh, physical sure. risk, almost sure. none. Uh, some financial <coughs> risk, I mean, in the UK, you know, people use libel actions uh, directly against a journalist rather than an organisation to, to shut mm -hmm. them up. Mm -hmm. So I could get that. But generally, a lot of that, that's moderate. But what's, what's really interesting is that the risk of the organisation goes up very dramatically. And it is embarrassing for a news organisation when their, their correspondents are, are badly injured or, or even killed. But if, if you're a large organisation, you can handle it. It's probably covered by the insurer. If you use big data or you know, uh, you know, publicly available information to accuse a, uh, an organization of wrongdoing, they could really significantly damage that, that news organization. So the question becomes, what will the news organization do? Yeah. Will it stand behind that or not? And you know, so the courage there really has sure. to be required of the organisation. Yeah, yeah, I know you want to comment on this. As the, as the data journalist, the, the idea of, of dangers lurking uh, is maybe anathema to you. But but look, the, the dangers are there, as Thomas said. The dangers are there. Um, I would say that the dangers are there if you don't consult the experts, if you don't talk to people, if you don't have a colleague check what you're doing. But I would say, listening to the two winners today, we trust them. We trust them to talk to the right people to describe the situation in Yemen and Pakistan the right way. Mm. They could also go there. I have never been to Yemen. You could paint me a picture that is totally wrong. And we know of foreign correspondents who have done that in the past. So I would say it's up to our professionalism. We trust uh, the great professionalism that is here in this room when it comes to foreign. So in the same way, we should trust the professionalism of a data journalist. For me, it's but, 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 but journalism. My question, my yeah. question, we, we trust our owner for her, yeah. for, for the, for her work. Yes, of course. You know, we, we trust in a, a data journalist for the interpretation of the data. When our owner starts interpreting data, do we trust her to do that? Well, that's why I'm collaborating with somebody because exactly. I don't trust myself in the sense that it's not that I'm going to try and make up stuff, but it's the issue of the, the risk of making mistakes when you're dealing with something that you're not familiar with. But, but also, a data journalist, if I go in, for instance, like my two years in London here have made me into a property reporter. I never did a story of property until I came to London of sort of, of reasons. But I don't have that all that knowledge about property. So when I do my analysis, I, of course, pair up with reporters who has that knowledge, who can, and we can together collaborate on these stories, so we will have a discussion. I will say, I see this in the data, and he said, yeah, 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 that's no news. And then I say, well, I see this, and he says, wait a minute, we're onto something, and we collaborate together. We interview the database in a way so that we find the story that we want to tell. And I am a great fan of collaborating. At The Guardian, we have great developers that can help us. We have great reporters that have the the knowledge of the issues that I can collaborate with. So I think that is the, the answer okay. to that. You know, another, another part of this I find fascinating is the way data helps us find stories. Um, you know, rather than getting a whole team of reporters to go out and discover stuff and investigate stuff, you've got a, a, a bank of two or three data journalists who will go through reams of numbers and say, great story there. You still have to send the reporters out, though. I mean, the, 
the story doesn't end with the spreadsheet. That's, that's really bad data journalism, actually, and boring. I mean, we won't see them, but it's really boring when you have a story that's just numbers and no people. I mean, we all, I think most of us, came into journalism because we love to tell stories. I love to find those stories in the data and work together with reporters who then have a different stepping stone than if you just would send them out into, I mean, where would you send them? Hmm. I can tell you where we would go, where we should go to do our reports about London property or uh, whatever. I mean, that is, that gives us, data gives us a, starti a starting point and it helps us find the stories, but we can't stop there. We have to do the reporting as well. All right, well, let, let, me, let me put it this way then. When you're, when you're asking any of these people, when you're looking for your next journalist at The Guardian, are you looking first and foremost for a good data person or first and foremost for a good writer? Well, for my team, who is the data journalism team, I would look for a person who has somewhat of a structured mind and very good attention to detail and for, foremost who is a good journalist the technical skill i can always teach them the technical skills it has to do with curiosity it has to do with attention to detail i think that that is one of the most mm. important things tom bergen i don't know if you know but tom was, was is one of our journalists who who uncovered a lot of the corporate tax avoidance stuff the, the starbucks and the googles and and, 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 and what have you a few years ago. I'm sure you, you all read those stories. Tom, when you, when you look at that sort of investigation, was it the, the interpretation of the numbers and writing the story that excited you, or was it looking at those numbers and finding the story in them that excited you? I mean, it's, uh, I think that if, the thing with data is you can see a trend and it might look interesting. Um, but it, it is the story behind that and the intention behind it, which is often interesting. So, um, you know, if I think about a story I did, did, did at the end of last year, it was about the big investment banks here not paying any tax. Well, that's, that, that's interesting. But unless you're actually showing why they don't pay tax, and if that's something we should be concerned about, then, then, then you don't really have it that interesting a story. Okay, you're going to get some headlines, but still the key is the driver behind it. And I think that, you know, you mentioned there the, the, the Starbucks story, and I think that that was, that, that was something that was a lot of work on uh, data diving and, and analyzing accounts. But essentially, that came down to one simple thing, and the reason that it resonated with people was because it showed that there was, a, there was, there was an inconsistency, perhaps, a lie there. <coughs> Excuse me, a company is saying, on the one hand, to the tax authority, we make no profits, therefore we should, should, should not pay any tax. On the other hand, they're telling their investors they're making a lot of money here. There's, a, there's an amazing amount of work that goes behind that, the way, the way that we can hold that up and say that's something that is questionable um, because of the investigations, the, the accounts, and, inve and interviewing former employees, etc. But essentially what you're doing is taking a lot of complicated stuff and just kind of almost having that aside by showing up, there, there's, there's a lie here. Mm. If it's Google saying, we don't have salespeople in London, that's why don't we don't have to pay tax. Yeah. We go out, we find the salespeople. So it's trying, trying to convert, convert something really complicated into something simple. And therein is the, the journalistic exercise, I guess. But you've got that head on your shoulders, right? That, I mean, well, yeah, you've got, you, I, mean, when I, I guess when I'm looking at stuff, I'm not generally actually trying to find the trend per se. Okay. That's really a starting point. Okay. Then what I'm trying to do is visualize the system. So what I'm looking at is, okay, that's a bit odd. There's, there's, there's money going there. There's a lot of trade to that particular place. And then I'm conceptualizing, well, what kind of operation is this? Is this really a profit-making normal enterprise? Or is it a money laundering enterprise? Or is it a tax avoiding enterprise? Mm -hmm. So I'm trying, trying to visualize the system. You, I, you, you talked about, and, and I know you can't talk much more about uh, this, this project you've just embarked upon, but is that sort of thinking, is that going to be more your thinking going forward in your journalism, your day-to-day -day work? Yeah, I think so. It's about looking for those trends that you may have got hints of from the ground. And I mean, Yemen's particularly difficult because you can go up to three people and ask them the same question and you'll get 10 different answers. They'll contradict themselves even. So it can be very confusing sometimes when you're getting a series of information on the ground, even when three or four people are backing it up and you always have the journalistic thing of, oh, you need at least two sources or three sources on the story. Um, but sometimes even in those 
sort of complexities where the politics is very difficult, and particularly when you're in a civil war scenario, when you've got sort of polarization of the story and, and people sort of feeding in propaganda on both sides. Uh, but then when you get hold of some data, um, and that shows a trend, and that backs up what you've been told on the ground, it's almost kind of a relief, really. And it means, OK, this is now a story. It's not, it might be a story, and I'm a bit concerned. Mm. It actually then, I, I know you were saying about, you know, um, uh, publishers are being brave about using the data, but actually in a, in a scenario like that, it's actually, a, it's, it's the fallback, really, because without it, um, then it could be, somebody could very easily wiggle out of it or the lawyers could get involved or, you know, yeah, uh, etc. Yeah. But when you've got the data to back it up, then there's very little wiggle room. But you worry about the dangers? Um, I... I, I haven't, maybe I haven't dealt with data enough to, to have to, um, to worry that. I mean, worry about that. It was getting the stuff on the ground that was, was, the, was the dangerous part for me. It was going through sort of 450 miles of Al-Qaeda country is perhaps a little more tricky than dealing with the data. <laughs> Sorry, that was... Um, you know, no, hey, I, I'm going to open it up in just a second. Yeah, I'll open it up in just a second. I, I just, I know one of the things, um, and we talked about this beforehand, Helena, um, uh, data journalism as a genre, and you don't like that, this idea. And there was this quote I read um, when I was prepping for this panel. Data journalism offers, uh, sorry, data journalism only differs from words journalism that we use a different kit. It's like photo journalism, just swap the camera for a laptop. Is that simplifying it too much? I mean, I am not too fond of the fact that I, that a lot of people think that I work in a special genre. Uh, because we don't talk, I mean, in the, when I started, it was called computer-assisted reporting. We never talk about telephone-assisted reporting, even though we actually do telephone-assisted reporting every day, maybe a little too much sometimes, or pen and paper-assisted reporting. We sort of, and the same way I would say that the computer is a tool, our methods is a tool, and that is also what makes my work so creative, is that there's so many tools in the toolbox. And... In one way, I feel a little sad for journalists who say, I don't want to do that, that's boring, it's just numbers. Because it's not. It's people. Every row in a database is a person, or a place, or a property, or whatever I'm now, or a company, uh, that I'm looking at. And it's my creativity that sort of lets me sort of lure out the story on that, in one way. And I, I told you before that I actually look upon sort of my spreadsheets and my databases as interview people. Hmm. I mean, I am interviewing them, and it's the same way as a good interviewer. I have to ask questions, listen to the answer, do follow-up questions on that answer, the ones that we sometimes actually forget to ask. Or I have to find a new person, a new database, to contradict my data in order to sort of see what is the true thing. So in one way, I think that it's a very, it's a very, very creative job for me. It's okay. not. Okay. Um, I'm told this is a crowd that has lots of questions. So I, I, I've, I've been instructed to stop pretty early and open it up to the floor. So let's have some questions from, uh, from you lot out there. Yeah. Gentlemen there. I think we've got a microphone. Have we got a microphone? Maybe you just need to stand up and yell. Oh, we do have a couple of mics. There we go. Yeah. Right over there. Tell us, who, t tell us where you're from. Uh, I'm from Turkey and currently studying financial journalism at University. And I have a question for Tom. Uh, you, recent, uh, you mentioned that uh, stories about tax avoidance should be, should be focusing on the underlying causes. But, I mean, the underlying causes of these issues are like what, they, what these companies do are mostly legal and they're like, creating loopholes, but the way the media uh, tells these stories are like, these companies are not paying taxes, and in a way it's kind of speculative. I mean, do you agree with that? And if not, how do you think the big media can change this? Well, I think that um, I, on the tax avoidance issue, I think what's interesting, uh, you know, the laws haven't changed, but I think there's been a huge amount of progress in, in the public, understanding on that issue. You know, about 10 years ago, uh, corporations were shunting 
all their money into tax havens, and they said that's just the way big business would work. If you could understand it, you'd understand it's perfectly legitimate. Now, what we've seen is, over the past few years, because of a lot of reporting on that subject, we see, yes, it is phony. Yes, you are ripping off the taxpayer. And now, if you listen to the commentary from the OECD, who provides government's advice on these issues, they say, yes, it's phony. This stuff should not be happening. Five, six years ago, they didn't say that. So I think that the, you know, and I would say reporting has played a lot into that, that um, these behaviours are not consistent with any intended legislation. Um, this is not efficiency. This is somebody not paying money that every government has said they should pay. So I think if anybody holds that up and suggests that they, this is money that people are trying to stretch the rules, I'd say that's pretty accurate. And I think that any journalist who says that's the case, I'd say is also being pretty accurate. So. OK. Have another question. Hi, um, I'm Anastasia and I'm a journalism fellow at the Reuters Institute. And I have a question to Elena. Uh, so I'm making a research about investigative data journalism. And I wonder, speaking of dangers, how much open data that is provided is a smokescreen or how much it actually allows to make a qualitative data investigations? That's a, that's a really good question because I think that if we look at the US who sort of started this in, in one way, and uh, I would say that the big open sort of open data initiative there, if you talk to data journalists on uh, there, they would say that most of the data that is published as open data is actually quite useless for us. And it actually makes it harder for us to use freedom of information requests because they will say, well, we have published this data, so why are you asking for that data instead. Um, and I actually have, am pleasantly surprised coming to this country because I think that the data that is provided here are in some cases, like for instance, when it comes to property, quite good. It's open, it's electronic, uh, but still the really good data, I think it's really important that we don't use open data to cover the fact that sometimes we also have to ask for data through Freedom of Information Acts. And in some cases, you are right. In some cases, I see that they provide tons of data sets that is of agencies love statistics, for instance. And for some strange reason, they think that statistics is what we love. But statistics is always, always tells an old story. The statistics are always almost a year old since that incident happened that became that statistic. Whereas I'm very fond of, for instance, the Land Registry's property database, who gives me almost in real time the sales that have happened all through England, and I can go in, uh, I can go in and look at them, sort of row by row. Every row is a sale. I can see the price. I can see where it happened, and that sort of thing. And that kind of data, that kind of raw data, where every row is a person, a place, an event, something. Uh, that is data I would want to see more of, and that is kind of unusual to get. Actually. Do you ever though? You, and, uh, do you ever? Okay, statistics is sort of it's old, but when, when you look at some of this new data, do you ever worry that your team, your people, anyone out there for that matter, is is going to interpret this in a way that's going to mislead? Constantly. Um, yeah. Constantly, I worry about that all the time. Yes, and, of course. But, but how how do you how do you monitor that? How do you direct that? How do you... You talk to people. You have to, I mean, this is our job. We talk to people. We talk to experts. I talk to experts in the field. I try to talk to the people who actually have done those databases to make sure that there are no... That I am actually... I, I would say that I've never done a story without sort of talking to the people that have done that data in order to make sure that I have interpreted the data right. Maybe if I've used just ONS data because they're quite reliable, to be honest. Uh, so yes, that's a constant worry, because you can, as a friend of mine did when he made a database of all the salaries of the Supreme Court judges in Sweden and actually made a, a, put the comma in the wrong, or the point, sorry, you have a point, the decimal point in the wrong place. And he went out and he accused 
one of the judges that he had made this much money extra outside of his work, and the judge threatened to sue, of course, because the decimal point was wrong. I mean, there's, you always worry, but you check and you check again, and you talk to people, and that's what you do. If I stopped worried, then I would be worried. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, on, on, on that one, I mean, obviously, the, the data we have is often very partial. Um, and but just journalists and non-data journalists are, are readily accepting of data provided to us, uh, partial data provided to us by special interest groups and accepting it on the basis of their own interpretation. Which is a real worry. A real worry. Right? I mean, I, I, an example, I did a story last year about Greece and the shipping industry. Greece, shipping industry has been living on the pig's back for the past 50 years because it's been telling everybody that they are 10% of the economy. They've received subsidized loans, every kind of tax break, and all. Uh, also, they don't have to. Uh, their workers don't have to be covered by local labour laws. They get a whole bunch of uh, of benefits, all because they're ten percent of the economy. They're not ten percent of the economy in any way we'd ever understand that. It's more like one percent. They're ten percent of about of foreign exchange earnings if you count it in the way that they do there, which is the only place in the world they do that. The problem is everybody who receives a press release from the, the shipping organisation sees this, we're 10% of the economy, and they write it. Now, there is no data to get to the official data to judge how much they contribute, because all they contribute, all that they count is the top line, what comes in. They don't count what goes out. And when you do that, what, which I did from compiling company accounts of the shipping companies, mm -hmm. you could see that 90% of it was going back out. So you're left with about a 1% contribution as, a pro as opposed to 10. The point being, if the data doesn't allow you to come to a conclusion, don't accept that you have a conclusion just because a PR sent it to you. And that's something for everybody, not data. Okay. 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 Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Gentlemen, right there. This one wasn't an innocent mistake, I suspect. <laughs> Hi, T Tony Austin. Um, I'm a ro former Reuters correspondent. I joined the company about 40 years ago. About the same time as Barry here, but I uh, didn't stay quite so long. Um, when I joined Reuters, I thought this is the best news organization in the world. And there's something of me that still believes that, and I'm proud to do so. But I feel, un unfortunately, that standards are slipping. Not Reuters, but the rest of the world. And I, feel, I, I, say, that, I say this because the BBC, which used to be almost as, as good as Reuters at being objective, I think, I think, let us down, particularly on the Brexit vote. And the, my question to the panel is, do you believe in an objective truth, and how are we going to promote that? Who wants to say that first? Diana. Um, I'm one of those militant people that believes that objectivity is a myth, to be quite honest with you. Um, Maybe that's, you know, I, I write now for outlooks like The Intercept, which are openly adversarial. Um, but, uh, I, I mean, some people would call that standard slipping. I, 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 I personally don't. Um, and, you know, much of the work that I entered for the award tonight was, was published by them. Um, but, you know, they started up because... Um, they felt standards were slipping. They weren't happy with the state of journalism in the US and decided to, to sort of try and start something fresh, something new in the US that was more challenging um, to the status quo, really. So, um, I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not one of those people that really believes that um, objectivity is, 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 yeah, that it is a bit of a myth that we can be balanced in the process that we use when we go about our journalism, mm. um, but we're human beings, actually, and um, if I went about what I was doing in Yemen um, in this sort of uh, sterile, objective, objective way, um, there was no, there's no way that I would, for example, be calling out the Saudis for um, violations of international humanitarian law, which if you spent any time on the ground in Yemen, uh, are quite clear yeah. and, and blatant. Yeah. And I, I think that would actually be wrong of me to walk away and say, well, this is what mm. the Saudis mm. said, mm. this is their defense, etc." So you also disagree with the way the BBC covered the Brexit referendum? <laughs> uh, Tom. Um, yeah, standard slipping, uh, hard to judge. I mean, I, I, 
I think that Reuters, that the standards have improved. I mean, I think certainly on the one I, I, I talked about in readiness to stand up the power, power that can hurt the organization, I've certainly seen, seen, a, seen a readiness to confront corporations that's much stronger now than it was in the past. But in terms of objectives, I mean, I cover a different kind of reporting to you. Know, so I would say yes, and, and maybe that you, you will say I would say that. But I think that if you look at Brexit, for example, I think that you know, there are certain things that are just both conceptually and legally possible, and there are things that are not. Now, um, you, you know, what, the kind of trade deals that we can have, um, for example, if Britain is a big, uh, apologies for getting a bit technical here, but Britain's a big exporter of services. You know, if you want to have a trade deal, you, you really want it to be something that allows you to export services, not widgets, because we don't, we don't export widgets. So then, you know, for data report or other kind of investigative kind of technical reporter, you go out and say, well, does anybody have these trade deals outside, outside the EU? If they don't, well, then you're saying, you know, clearly the people who say we have no problems outside Europe and we can cut trade <coughs> deals with, with China, that their analysis is pretty bad. Um, now, I don't think that that's being biased. I don't think it's being anti-Brexiteer. I think it's just being factual. So I think that, I think with the kind of work that I do, that I can show you that money ended up in Bermuda. It didn't end up being taxed anywhere. Or, or I can tell, show you factually that these, this medical equipment that goes into Siberia at three times the price, and I can show you exactly where, in, you know, where the shell, which shell company ended up with the money. And so I, I, I and, and, and you can see on the basis of that, you know, where regulatory fail, failings are. And I, I, I think you can be objective. Mm -hmm. I'm, okay. I'm, I'm not bothered okay. by that. Okay, Helen, let's get your viewpoint on Yeah. Having spent 20 years at national public television where we, by law, are obligated to be objective, my answer is in one way no to that question because we always have a perspective as a journalist. I have a perspective that is different than you and you. Uh, but that said, I will also say that if we talk about objectivity as he said, she said, and just sort of giving those two viewpoints and thinking that we're objective just because we give those two viewpoints, I think that the reporting that the three of us do takes us one step further. We, we go in and we try actually to explain and not just sort of take that for granted. So in that way, I'm, I'm striving towards that. Yeah. I think it's hard. I think I'm not sure that we, but, but to strive for that, yes, but to succeed, maybe not. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, gentleman right here. Got time for a couple more. <clears throat> Thank you. I'm Derek Thorne from the Thomson Reuters Foundation. Very quick suggestion for Iona. I think you should take a Brompton to Yemen. Uh, folding bike is probably a best bet. Um, but my question is actually about this idea of the front line. I was wondering, this is probably for Helena and Tom mostly, but I was wondering to what extent the tax haven is the front line. Because if you're looking at the ownership of a mansion in London or a, a suspicious company and you're following that trail, then the trail probably stops at a tax haven also known as a secrecy jurisdiction, that's where you can't find out who the owners are. And unless you have a big leak, then you're stuck. And so is that one of the key front lines? And do you have any hope that that is going to be broken through by anything other than a leak? Sorry. Uh, well, I, 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 <laughs> this is going to be more I mean, I guess this, this comes to one of the questions about the dangers is because you know, in my case, I came up against Basak Fonseca gets to the end of the road. You, you fortunately got a bit beyond that. Um, and so I, I end up looking for proxies for a lot of things, and then therein can, can lie the danger sometimes. Maybe, you know, if people won't comment when you, when you, when you put things to them, uh, and you maybe have erroneously interpreted something. But um, I'm not optimistic about getting a lot of data out of them, so I generally try and find other, uh, you know, proxy information. What I mean specifically could be a particular company might not publish any accounts, but I can find other ones who do business with it, who've got notes in their accounts buried down in it that, that give you some insight in there. So um, yes, they are certainly a sort of front line in financial transparency. And I think that, you know, in, in terms of, of, of trying to tell the truth about, you know, the world that we live in, certainly the Western world and how fair it is, I think that that is a front line and, and how successful we can be on it. I, it maybe you know, with the kind of experience you've had, you, you can, can shed more light on it. Well, I think that with, <coughs> with the one of the one of the things with the Panama Papers and actually with the previous projects like 
Lux leaks and, and, uh, and Swiss leaks and offshore is that is that I think you're right. I think that that is one of journalism's front lines right now is that we want to go in there. We want to get further than we did. And in one way, these leaks, one leaks that leads to another, I don't think that whoever the person was who called Bastian Obermeier at Süddeutsche Zeitung, I don't think he had called him if there hadn't been, if WikiLeaks hadn't been there, if offshore leaks hadn't been there, if there hadn't been... So we, what we see now in one way is that we get more and more people who actually get upset over what they see in their work and saying, I don't like that big corporations are hiding their money like this as I sit here as an account. I have no clue who this person is. Nobody, it said, has. But as I sit here as an accountant. Uh, but also actually using Panama Papers to actually change the law, change uh, force companies to give up their beneficial owners or their persons with significant control. Um, we see that uh, UK is the first country in the world, I think almost, that is trying to make a database of uh, companies' beneficial owner, owners, for instance. Uh, when we did the proper, we, when we did a proper story about the ownership, the offshore ownership of London we had the mayor come out and say that maybe I should, maybe it shouldn't be allowed to own property uh, from an offshore company. I think the, so the, the beneficial ownership laws, the, 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 this database um, here in the UK plans predated Panama Papers. Though, it right? did, but it, it, <coughs> I think it did in one way, but I think that it, that it actually has come into place. Okay. Would okay. probably be not just Panama Papers, but other Bit leaks. Of so, yeah, minimum Yeah, okay. um, One more question. Yeah, uh, yeah, go ahead. Thank you very much. I'm Samira Kawar. I'm a freelance energy writer for Argus Media, and I also provide some training for the uh, uh, Thomson Reuters um, Trust. Um, my question is this, if, and it's ma mainly to uh, Tom and Helena, um, a lot of these documents, I presume, that, uh, or data that comes into the hands of journalists is highly, highly confidential. How can you have the confidence to use that and know that it's not fraudulent or that someone has leaked it to you who has an agenda and might be using you to incriminate someone? How, how can you be absolutely sure that what you're using is not a fraud? Well, I mean, for me quickly, I mean, most of the work I do is publicly available information. So I'm trying to mine uh, information that is publicly available to anybody to see something that's you know, the, 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 usually by overlaying different data sets. So it could be procurement databases with company accounts and other things. But in terms of when, you know, they're, they, they are non it is non-public information, like bank databases or things like that, transactions, you, you know, you need to check it out um, and go to people who are the subject. I mean, you know, Boyer's practice is no surprise as journalism. So early on, they go to people and say, look, it looks like you're a crook. Do you want to tell me, are you a crook? Um, <laughs> And, um, you know, usually people have some reaction to that. <laughs> no, I, I think that that is, I think you're, you're putting a very important point, is that we, we can never be 100% sure. We can never be, I, I had, besides Panama Papers, I also had the privilege to, six years ago, work at on the, one of the WikiLeaks databases, and we spent an enormous amount of time going through this and trying to verify all the reports that we saw in the Iraq war logs with other reports, with, with public information of different kind. And the same thing with, with the Panama Papers. And as you said, then of course, before publication, confronting people that we're writing about and, and writing them and saying, it looks like you have a company here in, in Panama. Uh, can you have any? I think we sent, I don't know how many letters we sent, but there were over a thousand letters before we published Panama Papers from The Guardian. So we wrote a lot of letters. We started sending them out way before just to make sure. And that you, the, my biggest fear is actually that among the genuine data that somebody would put in one or two documents that are off, that's always the, the scare. But we try to check, we try to check every detail that we use in the way that we can as much as possible. 
but I will again go back to sort of other types of methods within journalism, which is that when you have a source in when you have a source that can't be named that tells you stories, you have to put in one way deal with that in the same way. You listen to that source and then you try to verify what he or she is saying. Um, if we're looking at you know the Watergate. Uh, there was a source there. What if he was lying? What if he had an agenda? It's the same way. We have to be journalists first. Okay. I'm going to stop it there. Um, we're all going to be outside, um, so do come and grab the panelists if you've got uh, more questions. I want to leave it there because I think it really does link the two parts and shows how well this discussion fits into this evening. And when I was first confronted with this title, I, I, I wondered where it would fit in, but uh, it clearly does. Uh, Iona Craig, Tom Bergen, Helena Benson, thank you very much indeed.